let's go to lunch. Right? Yeah, you go know, talk to them at lunch. Oh. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. Thank you for taking the time on a Saturday morning to, we could have been, done, been doing many other things, but you chose to come hear me speak. Hopefully what I have to say makes it worthwhile. We can decide that after the fact. But anyway, I'm Paul Roddy. I'm a professor and chair of the Aerospace Mechanical Engineering Department here at USC. And uh, a few years ago, uh, the students were asked, the graduate students who were required to take this seminar class, were asked to vote for which of our faculty they would like to see give a presentation. Normally we have outside visitors, we wanna have some of our own faculty present to our graduate students. And so for some reason, um, for some reason I was elected. I'm sure there was some ballot stuffing and all that. But, uh, <laughs> but in any case, uh, they, they elected me. So I thought, well, what should I, what should I tell them? I say, well, if they wonder about my research, you know, they've heard about my classes, they hear about it from my other students. Um, they don't really need to hear me talk about my research again. So what else could I tell them that might be interesting? And so one thing that sort of always had been in my the back of my mind is to, um, to look into this topic, serendipity. Serendipity has played a big role in my research. And the more I looked into it, I realized plays a big role in other people's research. So let's put together and see, I mean, I had a, a preconceived idea of what, what the conclusions would be in terms of who makes these great serendipitous or contrarian contributions to science. Uh, and it turned out my, my initial impressions were all wrong. Not the first time, wrong would be the last time. So, uh, <clears throat> Anyway, I like this expression, hit them where they aim. So what is, what, what is that? Anybody know where that came from? You know where they aim? Okay. Technology was working just fine. So basically, when you write down to it, most great scientific discoveries are really the result of accidents. In a sense, that almost has to be so, because if the result that you've got, whether it be computation, experiment, whatever, if the result were consistent with what you expected, that's not really new knowledge. That's just confirming the knowledge that you already had or thought you had. And uh, so my experience, you know, so I, I've been uh, a faculty member since 1986, not here, first in Princeton for seven years, and then here for the past 30 years. Uh, it's my experience today that uh, researchers today are much more along the lines of this follow me or meet. This was the first Me Too movement, was uh, where, where so many researchers seem to follow the same pattern. I remember I was a I was a program chair for a large meeting in my field, combustion research. This was in 2010, big meeting. There was like over a thousand papers submitted and they were fully peer reviewed. So we had to whittle it down to about a third that number. And there were so many papers from different groups around the world, were virtually identical. You know, one topic in particular at that time, biofuels was really hot. So everybody was studying biofuels using the same experimental techniques and the same computer codes with the same chemical and coming up with such the same results. I thought it was great if I got another one of those. <laughs> so I like to think that I've been, please come in. That, that uh, I like to think that my research, I try to be not so much in this me too, uh, but I found in general researchers, <clears throat> you know, nowadays compared to when I first started, are much more likely to adopt this follow me approach. Hey, if these very well-known names in the field did it, then I should do it too, right? <clears throat> and more trusting of the current wisdom than really questioning it. So the goal in today's lecture is uh, trying to develop an appreciation for this whole field of serendipity and contrarianism. And sort of give to first, you know, I'll focus mostly on historical examples. And if time permits, you know, some of my own examples of that. And, you know, provide some basic rules. This was aimed at graduate students. 
provide some basic rules, you know, for you to develop your own, you know, your own how to exploit serendipityism, if that's a word, and contrarianism in your own research. Okay, so famous example, radioactivity. activity. Henry Becquerel, he thought that certain materials could, you know, emit X-rays, which had recently been discovered, um, when illuminated by intense light, by sunlight. So what he did was that he took photographic plates, wrapped them in thick back black paper, covered them with these various phosphorescent materials, and then put them out in the sun. And nothing happened. Until they tried uranium salts. So, said, aha, uranium it can generate X-rays. Then accidentally left the plates out one day when on a cloudy day, did exactly the same thing. Wait a minute, it has nothing to do with sunlight. Um, and so he realized there was something completely new. His, his most famous student, Marie Curie, then isolated these materials, radioactive uh, elements. It turned out someone else whose name I don't remember is lost to history, discovered 50 years earlier that putting uranium salts on photographic plates would expose them. But that person said, oh my goodness, I will never put uranium salts on photographic plates. They've ruined them. Never do that again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. It could, it could yeah, quick question or connection. So can it be postulated that as a result of Henry, I don't know how to pronounce yeah, it, I pronounce it Becquerel, but Becquerel? I don't know that's mm -hmm. As a result of Henry Becquerel, you really had the springboarding of Mary Curie. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's my that's my understanding. Nice, interesting. Yeah. Oh, by the way, feel free to uh, to ask questions. You know, there's nothing more boring than for me to just sit here for an hour and lecture. I mean, I don't care if you're bored, but I. <laughs> <laughs> so there must have been some kind of like mentorship or continuing dialogue. I don't know any historical background. Are there? I don't know, except that um, Mary Curie was a student. Oh, well, there's a there's a movie. Oh, okay. we're, we're gonna have to see. It. Oh, okay. I wonder if he sourced or if he cited in that film. It's her whole life. Oh, yeah. Okay, but thank you, thank you. Interesting connection. Teflon. I think some of you. I remember reading about this. Did, did any of you? Probably not many of you are old enough. But uh, back in the sixties, we had this these time life science books. This whole say, so, okay, you know what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, and I remember reading about Teflon. Now, I was just a kid, but my parents, you know, they had two sons and they wanted us to be technologists. So that was, they're very good. Mm -hmm. they were very good. And even today, that I mean, obviously the technology has gone way beyond that, but it's still interesting to read them. Anyway, I remember reading about this that, uh, that uh, Roy Plunkett was working for some company that was trying to make a better refrigerant than, because uh, I think the refrigerants they were using were like propane or something. They wanted the non flammable refrigerant. And ammonia. And ammonia. Yeah, <laughs> nasty stuff. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, they were trying this uh, um, tetrafluoroethylene. And then one day they found that the pressure had gone to zero, but there was no leak in the tank. They could see. They weighed the tank, it still weighed the same. So then they cut it open and found that there was this white powder, which of course nowadays is uh, known as Teflon. And apparently, this is outside my field, but apparently the iron on the cylinder walls was the catalyst that allowed the polymerization process to occur. Hmm. Wow. Uh, in religious circles, that might have been known as sorcery back then. <laughs> <Right. No, yeah. laughs> the Big Bang, this was my title slide. <laughs> So, Penzias and Wilson, uh, 1964, I was just curious, they're, they're both, the, one is, I think, Wilson is like 88, and Penzias, I think, just turned, like, they're still around. Um, they were looking at, uh, they were communications engineers for Bell Labs, and they were trying to use something to bounce signals off of a, um, I guess, a luminized mylar balloon or something like that as a source of, uh, you know, as a, as a repeating station before satellites became the standard. And so they found that, you know, that they go, we're getting all this noise. And they kept getting this noise, kept getting this noise, even when they thought, well, it's thermal noise. They, even using liquid helium, 
they found that you know, to reduce the thermal noise. They still found the noise. And they assumed it was coming from you know, their New Jersey. They figured it was coming from New York City or someplace like that. <clears throat> but they found that the intensity of noise was exactly the same in all directions, any time, day or night. So it really had nothing. It was not an anthro anthropogenic source of this. And eventually they realized, because by curious, some faculty at Princeton at the time were thinking that there would there had been, you know, looking at the expansion of the universe, there must have been 14 billion years ago a big bang, and it should have emitted some radiation. And in fact, that the temperature that they predicted the radiation would have nowadays was very consistent with the apparent temperature of this black body. Is that based on the heat wavelength they were seeing? I think so. Yeah. Um, and they concluded it was uh, say a fossil remnant of the big bang that just by coincidence had been recently theorized by people just coincidentally right next door. That's, in fact, that's what my title slide refers to. This is, of course, much later. This is from Kobe, the cosmic microwave uh, background experiment, where they actually, because the, the, at that time, they couldn't tell how uniform or non-uniform because the difference in temperatures here and there were micro Kelvins, so they couldn't measure that time. But what they realized that this uh, OB satellite uh, actually then mapped out the whole the whole universe in terms of the this is not the intensity, this is the variation of the intensity about the mean. And so it shows that this is how the structure of the universe created. I mean, initially the universe were this 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 apparently. Not my field, I can't say yes, it's true or no, it's probably not true. But what I've read is that the universe was concentrated in one unimaginably small, unimaginably dense spot. But then structure emerged. We have all these galaxies and all that. How did it because of these, you know, of these instabilities? Because once basically what happens is once the universe expanded enough to where basically you know light and matter separated. There were these instabilities. Now this is getting close to my field. It's, it's like combustion instabilities that mm -hmm. then generate these non-uniformities. It's, you know, it's turbulence, basically. Okay. So, so it's, kind of, it's basically, it's actually turbulent combustion because it's it's not just flow, it's also chemical reaction, or of course, nuclear reactions in this case. Dark, kind of the same sort of dark to red is only on the order of microcalories. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it takes a long time in the satellite has to orbit and keep collecting data. And obviously the satellite itself. Has to have some pretty sophisticated low noise detectors to sense a micro Kelvin background on 2.7 Kelvin room temperature. Mm -hmm. Get this. LSD. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. So he was looking for, uh, yeah. he, he was looking for something to help, uh, uh, I guess, morning sickness in women. And uh, synthesized this chemical and set it aside for a few years, and then I came back to it. I don't know, but then when he touched it, you know, he experienced these uninterrupted stream of fantastic pictures. <laughs> <laughs> and he continued studying LSD, you know, and I guess other hallucinogens. Lived to be 102, so <laughs> <laughs> you know, agree with that. Again, all just you know, completely uh, serendipitous. Now. Of course, when I think about this, how many other, you know, uh, pharmacists accidentally touched something that was extremely toxic? Oh. Yeah. In the timeline that past 100 years, I'm sure you can. Yeah. Well, the, the, the analogy I always like to use is that my son uh, is, is very obsessed with trains, particularly old time steam locomotives. Oh. So I've learned a lot about the design. And they're like a thermal expansion nightmare, as you might imagine, because it's not just a simple, you know, tube that's got all these weird shapes right, right. and all around the firebox and all this. And there's all these weird design features. And you, know, you never would have thought of up front. And I realized every one of these design features was put there after there was an explosion. <laughs> said, you know, that's not the best way to do this. <laughs> This is one of my favorites is uh, is uh, microwave oven. Percy Spencer was a radar engineer, 
uh, actually um, actually had a lot of patents, was very well known in his field at the time. And then he noticed, um, you know, he was working on some radar system. He had a chocolate bar in his pocket. He leaned into the path of the uh, uh, of the radar beam, and the chocolate bar melted. And he actually wasn't the first to notice that, but the first to say, oh, this is interesting. So because the frequency of radar that he was using just happened to correspond to one of the resonant modes of water molecules. And uh, so it would then heat up the water. And so then he said, okay, this is interesting. So let's, uh, so let's see if we can make a purpose built, oven, which he did. And the first thing, of course, that he made was popcorn. And uh, so those who are old enough know that originally microwave ovens were called radar ranges, right? right. So I was right. wondering why they call it radar PHE. Yeah. yeah. So this one is for Captain Lessig. I guess there's some I guess there's some connection between Air Force pilots or Air Force pilots and the mouth. They're so close to radar. And the propensity for pilots to have females more than males. In Berkeley, have you heard of this room? I haven't heard. I've heard okay. that cor uh, correlation between pilots and uh, having girls. Obviously, I think it worked out for me. I got three boys. Okay, <laughs> but in your case, it was, I, I have seen where somebody forgot to turn the weather radar off, oh. and the uh, maintenance crew that was hanging out in front of the airplane all got basically like sunburned. Yeah, wow. yeah. Then that guy got to do a presentation in front of the whole squadron about the effects of radiation. Yeah, because these microwaves won't penetrate very far. It's skin, but yeah. enough to cause some yeah, 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 burning, burning, yeah. right? So, don't know what the guy was doing. To, 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 <laughs> well, but this also too, when these guys would lean in, like they're talking about, they didn't think it was a big deal no, at all right. that. Oh, it's it's just radio it's waves. It's yeah. not a big deal. Yeah. And then I mean, I understand that it affected the candy bar, and that it's probably also affecting them. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. So they actually developed safety yeah. features mm -hmm. sort of yeah. shortly after that. Sure. Yeah, you mentioned so well, something. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. In the 1980s movie, Rio Genius, uh -huh. when they blow up the popcorn in the home. Yeah, and the home expands. Yeah, remember? Yeah, yeah. Anything's in there. Right. Remember yeah. that? Generation X years. I oh haven't seen that movie. But Watch one, of our, one of our faculty is in oh, it's, it's or I guess there's a scene where there is a uh, where there's a professor, like a physics professor. Yes. And oh, as time goes on, more and more students just put their tape recorder. Yeah. yeah. And then yeah, he's the a end. professor there. <laughs> and then at the end, I guess he just puts his tape recorder there. The students put the <laughs> And it's just one tape recorder <laughs> speaking to other tape recorders. Yeah. 1986, watch it, but watch it. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Great, great. Uh, Real Genius, Val Kilmer, before he became Iceman and Top Gun. What's it? Uh, Real Genius. Yeah, oh, great. And movie. right up, exactly. Yeah. It, yeah, so he was the... Yeah. the it's, it's our tribe movie. It's a tribal movie for us in the science and technology. Yeah, uh, nitrous cellulose. So uh, Christian Shun be in the that way. Um, you, spilled a, you spilled a mixture of nitric and sulfuric acid, where this is going, and wiped it up with a cotton apron, hung it up to dry, and exploded. It was actually then recognized as a gunpowder alternative, but it was took a while. Like so many of these discoveries, it takes a long time to reduce it to practice. It's a practical. He also discovered ozone precipitously and, and then the fuel cell. Professor, so it'd be interesting. Is there an average of maybe this might make a good a good study, right? Between the time that these discoveries are made and between the practical applications? I, I haven't done that. I haven't done that. I thought you were going to ask what's the average age of these people. I do have that. Oh, okay. That but that's, but that's not it. That's that's an interesting observation. That's kind of the end of the talk. But yeah, but that's another interesting thing. What's the average time? And is it shrink? Well, is it shrinking, you know, since the 1800s? Right. I think Ray Kurzweil says in the last postulation, but let's make it we're down to eight, nine months now, right? Technology insertion. 
is changing every nine months. Mm -hmm. Some technology, something is coming online. Your, your, your age, <laughs> you guys are coming up with new stuff because of so many things, you know, um, creativity, all those different things. So nitrocellulose versus nitroglycerin, like are they connected? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of which one came first. Nitrocellulose came first. That's just gun cotton. Yeah. And it uh, replaced uh, black powder yeah. on the battlefield because uh, black powder produced so, so much smoke. Oh, yeah. That it, it made military engagement uh, difficult. Yeah. Uh, oh. So, because you would basically, you would be, after a, a few, few rounds, you, a few the, minutes, the sides couldn't see each other. other. <laughs> yes. yeah. Oh, yeah. And black powder. Yeah. 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 The black powder. Yeah. 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 to go one way, not two ways. So I'm saying, <laughs> But do you want to be the, the, the side with I you probably want to be the side with the black powder and you want them to have that like said. So you're kind of hidden behind this powder and yeah. you can it's still see that right cloud, right? Yeah. One of my favorite examples, uh, penicillin. That uh, Alexander Fleming was already, you know, a very famous <laughs> thinker. So he discovered the life design enzyme. Um, but he was kind of a sloppy experimentalist. <laughs> he left a bunch of petri dishes out when he went away on summer vacation. And when he returned, mold had grown, uh, but uh, the colonies of uh, Staphylococcus were, you know, it, near one type of mold was dead, whereas the uh, Staphylococci farther away was still alive. So again, he realized this was something interesting. So he said, did that mold kill the Staphylococci? And sure enough, he isolated that, what's now known as penicillin, and uh, showed it would kill many, uh, bacteria. Okay, so let's move on to uh, <clears throat> contrarianism. So I was like this, I thought it was Ty Cobb, but it wasn't Ty Cobb that first said this, that it was Willie Keeler, who was a baseball player, only five foot five and 140 pounds. You don't see too many of those sort of baseball players have days. But uh, you know, he had extraordinary hitting statistics despite his small size. And when some reporter asked, what's your secret? He just said, keep your eye clear and hit them where they ain't. So what are some, I'll go through a few examples. The, you know, I don't have time to go through all of these, but uh, you know, obviously one of the first, you know, heliocentrism, you know, evolution of species, relativity, quantum mechanics. I think quantum mechanics though is a little bit different in these, somebody realized something said, yeah, it's got to be this way. I think people kind of resisted. Even the people who developed the mechanics really didn't like the idea. They were kind of forced into it because there was no other way to explain so many things. Yeah, but I, I think you're missing a more subtle point there is that the greatest uh, uh, kind of uh, Einstein was credited as advancing the field of quantum mechanics, as we know, mm -hmm. uh, the, the greatest person who advanced actually was trying to uh, negate it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the photoelectric effect, but what all, all, all his, yeah. right. And so, uh, but that kind of leads into a question is so uh, he, he basically proposed a hypothesis that he said, no, this theory is absurd. This famous quote, God doesn't play dice. Nice. Yeah. And he said, if this nutty thing, I'm paraphrasing, yeah. but if he was polite, but yeah. if this nut theory is correct, then the following would uh, happen. Mm -hmm. And they went and observed and said, yep, that's what's happening, even though it makes no sense. Yep, you're right. The, and, and, and so with that contrarianism, I guess if I may ask a question. So in uh, in uh, debate or, uh, you know, uh, the field of debate, there's a, a rhetorical technique called playing the devil's advocate. Sure. Where you propose an idea uh, or propose a counter argument, not because you're advocating the argument, not because it's a good, a morally good argument, but it's a, uh, it, it's it's a the counter yeah. hypothesis yeah. to the extreme, yeah. and uh, so is there the devil's hypothesis in the scientific uh, uh, field where people? Purposely, well, sure. always, well, like in quantum mechanics, uh, it, uh, Paul Dirac realized that the equation was also admitted antimatter. Right. 
And then shortly thereafter, antimatter was discovered. Yeah. So as a professor, if I may ask you, the last one is uh, human caused climate change. Are people allowed to in 2023 as academics propose the devil's uh, hypothesis? In other words, hypothesis that asks perhaps this uh, Me Too movement is wrong or is that career damaging? Um, well, that in itself then becomes contrary. And once, let's just say, regardless of your opinion on right. this, let's suppose right. anything. Yeah, okay, let's suppose now human cause climate change is now the accepted. Right. If you are against that, now you are contrary. So, I mean, originally this was, this was, it was very uh, contrarian to say that we were actually affecting the climate. Now it's typically accepted. And now anyone who doesn't feel that way isn't the contrary. So what was the, the norm has now become the, the contrary. Um, that, uh, but yeah, that's, you're a Princeton grad, are you familiar with, uh, uh, what's it, uh, Dr. John, uh, Paul John, electric propulsion? Oh, yeah, uh, Bob John, yeah. Bob John, there you go, Bob oh, yeah. John. Very, and, very and, weird guy. Right, but he <laughs> was allowed. He's in my department. Oh, good, did you know him? Oh, yeah. Okay, I met, had the chance to meet him, uh, uh, yeah, when I was very young, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and he was allowed the scientific freedom to basically uh, explore uh, yeah, uh, tell him, or psychokinesis. But he approached it in a completely, yes. uh, I, I thought it was clairvoyancy, but anyways, he, he yeah. or something, but he approached it in a scientific manner, uh -huh. and his idea was he was going to disprove it. Uh -huh. And, uh, and he, he, what he ended up doing is creating experiments that were ambiguous and showed a positive result, which later went on to other discoveries about truly random number generation systems, mm -hmm. how hard it is anyways. But, yeah. but today, would, would uh, Bob John be allowed to, uh, can you promote any of those experiments? Well, I'm a tenured professor. I can't <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I tenured professors can be fired all the time. So. Yeah, I don't know. Are you well, about that? I can't do those things that the tenured professor is not fired. I want to piggyback on that. Are the professional friends? I think it's a really interesting point you bring because uh, one of our uh, senior generals, General Salzman, the Space Force, recently came out with, with a theory set. Get this for our professional workforce. I'm going to pick on you, Kyle, because you're the youngest. Um, and I'm doing this by, by choice. Um, so he has a theory, uh, and he's, he's drafted a theory set. Can go, I don't have it in front of me, but uh, I did kind of read over it. I have to go back and gloss over it. But he really is, in his theory, he's pushing the younger workforces, the potential guardians or the incoming guardians or the graduates from the Air Force Academy and the new to be very counter challenge to each other and to be contrary and contrary and he says these arguments how should be happening at the bars it should be happening at the commander's calls when you're having a couple of drinks with your buds with with the gals because it's that level of counter approach to the program that is going to give us a bigger result or pause more positive downstream effects. And if we incorporate that in our work mindset, Interesting. we we would by choice and by default be able to increase our orders of magnitude with our technology. Yeah. And it's yeah. interesting because it's being driven towards the younger guardians, the academy grads, the the, the, the guys and gals that are you know ROTC right the first five years. But what I'm saying is the exact opposite is are you being contrarian? Right. Yeah. 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 Is are you allowed to, in debate, you're allowed to make an argument that is, uh, it, it, it's uh, nefarious, but it's a logical counter argument in order to, you know, it has bad results, but it's a logical counter argument to be proven or disproven. And everyone says, well, of course, we'll disprove that. And that humanity is actually up. Uh, are you allowed to, from a reputation and so forth, to say, I do not believe this, but I'm going to make a devil's well, hypothesis? Yes. I, I mean, but the key point is nowadays so many people are contrarian, but they're only contrarian to the things 
what they don't want to believe. <laughs> you know, basically, you you it's like they, they, just, they treat like Jeopardy. Here's the answer, and I'm going to ask a question that leads to that answer, whether that answer is well. And I was just going to ask you that. I mean. There's so not, I mean, that, I'm talking about known the colloquial sense. You know, right. Yeah. And that's, already place that's right. And that's see is and people expressing one extreme view and ignoring every other side. And, and, and with that, the term that often gets used is you have deductive uh, reasoning versus inductive reasoning. Yeah. Deductive meaning that you have a hypothesis and you're going to find evidence to prove yeah. you're right, which I do every day. I'm always right. Yeah. Uh, versus <laughs> inductive, which as we all are. Yes. Yeah. But, but yeah, and so you just have to, from a professional point of view, yeah, I can certainly do that, but I better be ready to back it up. Yeah. I better right. be really right. Either, right. either show me the data or show yeah. me the math. Yeah. Validate, verify, yeah. substantiate it. You say, okay, I don't know if this, you know, I, I would tend to say, well, I don't know if this, what you're saying is true or not, but if it is true, this would have to be right. a consequence. Yeah. Well, so let's see if that's and what I would, of course what I would try to do is I would try to do it first. Right. If it was something I didn't want to do or was outside my wheelhouse, then I would just do it. So, so to tie that back to your introduction, you said you had conferences where you saw the same paper over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. The simplest uh, paper that would make not be alike would be someone proposing the opposite. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, if someone came up, okay, so 20 papers that are coming right. to the same conclusion about this topic, and if the 21st didn't, then you know, we'd have to look at that very carefully to see why is it different. You know, we, we, of course, yeah, we, we have to rely then on the peer reviewer, the anonymous peer reviewers. Um, you know, and that does happen on occasion is that, you know, one set of peer reviewers, they uh, review this paper and say, okay, this is acceptable. And then the other set of peer reviewers could, you know, say this other paper that shows a different result. And, you know, the key point is how well have those two opposing views, how well have they documented what they did? And is there, is the difference, is it a difference in maybe they did a little bit different experiment or they say it's a different pressure or they use a different apparatus? You, do, you and then, first, do you professionally have to hold your hypothesis? Yeah, that's all we have is our information. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a hypothesis. You can propose an hypothesis you want, but if you state it that way, I mean, typically, like when you're writing research proposal, right? One thing I need to see, because you know, of course, I have to review a lot of proposals by others. <laughs> the thing I hate to see more than anything else is when they say we are going to do these computations, and then we are going to do these experiments to verify the computation. That's right. You understand the problem with that? Because if I said you know, you, that, that means you already know the computations are going to give you the, the same answer. And if that's true, if you're sure, then it's not research. If so, you're overconfident or you're doing something that's already well known and well established. How, how many times as a reviewer of proposals have you seen people propose to disprove hypotheses? To disprove hypotheses. Yeah, that's what I'm really well, asking. Yeah, sure. Um, Quite a few times, but typically the way you would do it is you propose you, you would propose a hypothesis and say, "Here's our hypothesis. It's true or it's not true. Let's right. see. Here, mm -hmm. Here's how." And that's what I look for in any proposal <coughs> is uh, that I'm reviewing right. is okay. So here's my hypothesis, and maybe it's one I'm not at all sure about. Right. That's fine as long as you state I'm not sure about this. The key point is not what the hypothesis is, but what is your methodology for proving or disproving the hypothesis? How good is your approach? And will you at the end, then if you do this and you're successful in doing these experiments or these computations or whatever, how likely are you going to be, be able to either prove or disprove your hypothesis? Because a lot of proposals also fail. I actually give a whole seminar on writing compelling uh, proposals to our junior faculty. And, uh, a lot of times they'll do everything I said, but then they'll get, they'll propose the, they're going to get these results, but they never say what they're going to do with the results, how they're going to use the results <laughs> to either prove or disprove the yeah. hypothesis. So you've got to have, the main thing is, now we're talking about a different seminar. Hey, we can, we can switch. I've got it here. I've got it here. <laughs> but basically the main thing is have one really good novel idea and just sell it and sell it and sell it, you know, and I prefer it in the form of a hypothesis 
for who like NIH, that's absolutely must do it that way. Every point you make must be in the state. Hypothesis. NSF is not required, but I like that approach. Here's my hypothesis. So here's my topic, why it's important. I'm compl now complain about what's lacking in the state of knowledge. Here's my hypothesis about when I do the work, then I say how I'm going to actually you know, prove or disprove the hypothesis. And then once I have the data, how am I going to use it to prove or disprove the hypothesis? And then at the end, I say, okay, who cares? If I do, you know, my hypothesis is true or not true, who cares about that result? So obviously there, there's great payoff if you're able to be a contrarian and really change the game. Mm -hmm. But I would imagine 90% of the research projects might have bold intentions, but produce in a lot of cases negative results or, hey, well, we really didn't, we, we tested things, but the hypothesis was kind of proven and we really didn't contribute to knowledge other than uh, exploring a path that we don't think was tested before. Yeah, so. And certainly what I look for in a proposal is not, okay, I'm going to extend, I'm going to do this incremental thing, it'll kind of extend our knowledge. Okay, we, we did experiments up to 10 atmospheres, now we're going to do experiments up to 20 atmospheres. If you're going to do that, you must show why is it that I can't learn in 10 atmospheres? Why is it unreasonable to think I can extrapolate that? What fundamental new physics occurs mm -hmm. between 10 and 20 that I didn't have to consider at 10, but I need to consider at 20? You got to make a strong case for that. Otherwise, I don't think the proposal is, is good. Can I jump in here with an example? Please. I just want to call it Yep, yeah, please. you know, late in his career, Einstein took a contrary to uh, no, usual physics hypothesis that God doesn't play dice. And he said that he could because he had already shown his chops. So uh -huh. when you can, you can take a contrarian review when you've shown your chops, you're tenured, or you can start quietly and wait till you've proven that your hypothesis, is, your contrary hypothesis is right and then expose it. <laughs> yeah. So, and even even in the you know even the financial world, the control contra fund has been around for a long time now. Uh, that's her whole idea, and it makes a lot of sense. I've never understood the whole thing about oh, here's you know here's a hot stock. Now wait a minute. If everybody thinks this stock is going to double tomorrow, it's going to double today, right? Because no one's going to sell you know at one dollar if everybody believes it's going to sell at two dollars. Or, the, or if everybody thinks the stock's going to tank. Yeah. It's always like basically selling at the point where half the people think it's going to go up and half the people think it's going to go down. So unless you think you are smarter than one half or the other, what exactly are you doing? And you forgot to mention one of the better uh, stocks is the uh, counter Kramer fund. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, the, oh, the counter Kramer? Yeah, the... the so it means something to me. There is always value of contrarianism. It's yeah. the doubling down in which you start to eat away at the value add. Yeah, in fact, um, up this a long time ago, we were I was doing some engine research, and you know, our sponsor wanted our results to be compared, I want to say confirmed, but compared by an independent. And so Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio is very well known as being very reliable, you know, doing engine research. So they did that and, you know, they, they confirmed our results that we've done about all that. Um, and then so I met the Southwest people later on and said, okay, thanks for doing this. So we collaborated on this. Oh, by the way, you know, there's some, some person that contacted me that wanted to test his idea on uh, but I really don't want to do that. Do you want to? And I explained what the person wanted to do. Is, oh, this person's a true believer. So no, we don't deal with true believers. It's <laughs> <laughs> always saying they don't get, their, they, they're almost certainly not going to get the result they want. And then they will just not believe you and try not to pay you. So they say, no, don't send them to us. So yeah, you have to avoid the true believer syndrome. You really have to be willing to be humble you know, and that's why it's better just to state it as a hypothesis, not as a definitive conclusion, because you, know, you might be wrong. I mean, you have to be really, really confident, really, really sure if you're going to say, this is the way it is. Not if it's not a hypothesis, this is the way it is. And, and I think if I may say, there's the other problem, which 
perhaps since you're in academia, you don't run into, which I've run into, and you, you talk about the believers and you've got the going with the crowd. Another phenomenon I've seen in research is I'll call it the desert island phenomenon, mm -hmm. where basically there's a researcher doing work and no one will engage and actually, whether the work is good or bad, they're talking to themselves and they can't get anyone else to propose or uh, review or criticize uh, uh, in, in, in its stagnation. It results in uh, academic stagnation because there's no community. Yeah, uh, I've run into a number of these desert island people. And typically what I found though is the desert island I'm not really an engine expert, but I do engine experiments, and there's really like nobody like at Caltech or UCLA or or on that do the, these sort of things. So all the crackpot inventors, they sort of they eventually get funneled to me, <laughs> and so I listen for a couple of minutes, and they're not even violating the second law of thermodynamics; they blow right past the second law of violating the first law of thermodynamics. And so I listen to about thirty seconds, and then I'll say. I don't really know too much about that. Why don't you call it UCLA? <laughs> I don't tell them who to call it UCLA because they're my friends up there. <laughs> but, um, um, but yeah, but I was going to say that most of these sort of desert island folks, they usually have kind of a uh, a fanboy. I say fanboy, it's usually it's always a boy, a man for some reason. Because they, because someone has sort of said, okay, here this person's a genius, and then they have sort of their disciple, who then is the one who contacts me, because that person is too lofty to interact with me directly, so they go through this intermediary, and uh, that's usually how the the crack bomb inventors work through their <laughs> fanboy. I don't mean that in a gender specific context, right. and of course. Very famous example of Turingism is uh, alternating current. Yes. And I don't think I even have to go through this. Uh, obviously, we know why <coughs> that uh, alternating current is a much better way of trans uh, um, uh, uh, transmitting power over long distances, at least before the days where you could, we were at rectifiers. I mean, nowadays, of course, you know, very large power, very, very high power. Transmission is done by DC to reduce the losses. Yeah. However, transmitting electrical power wirelessly yeah. with AC is not. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 The FCC. Yes. Frequency modulation. So, um, at Armstrong, it was already it was already well known communications engineer. Well, FM and showed us much more resistant to noise than AM modulation. And uh, RCA other companies had uh, a vested interest in their AM standard. And so there were battles. And actually, it turns out he committed suicide because he received any royalties all of his years and uh, years later after the lawsuits. Was his death the result of his, the, the denial of the community? I believe so. Right, really financial destitution. Yeah, financial, yeah. That's it's so bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then of course even Tesla yeah. died, you know. Anyways. This is really, you know, I, who would have thought? Okay. I mean, if you told me, oh, the dinosaurs became extinct because of a, a meteorite. But uh, Louis Alvarez was already a uh, Nobel Prize winning Business. And his son was a geologist. And uh, I guess one day they were saying, you know, this layer here is where the dinosaurs were extinct. Nobody knows why. And so um, the, the senior Alvarez, Luis Alvarez, um, said, well, okay, uh, did this happen over a short period of time or a long period of time? And was it a million years or was it 100 years? And so Using radioisotope decay, they realized it was a very, very rapid period. And they also noticed that that layer contained much more iridium than other sources. And, and because he was a Nobel Prize winning physicist, he had access to all kinds of, uh, of instrumentation and equipment. So they found there was iridium in there. And they said, well, what, what, is, what is in there? That's, that's a big step there. 
because they said, here's some soil, tell me everything that's in there. And the thing that was in there that was unusual was iridium. There's not very much iridium on Earth, but I guess uh, meteorites have a lot more. And so we postulated that that would be a meteorite. And you know, he was very highly criticized. He died, this is 1980. I think he passed away around 1987 or so. And it was not accepted in his lifetime, but of course, nowadays it's, uh, it's very well accepted. And, you know, of course, now if you don't believe that, you're contrary. And then there's still, I mean, it's not my field. I have no particular, all I, all I can say about it is what I read. Well, it seems like those dinosaurs were very smart contrarian dinosaurs because they're looking yeah. up and they're saying, look, yeah. we're about to die. Yeah. <laughs> the dinosaurs were probably like, <laughs> what I wonder is who took the picture. Right, right. right. Yeah. <laughs> They just got to have their camera ready. Yeah. If I made this debate continues, I don't know if you're aware, but there are uh, anthropologists who are proposing a uh, meteorite impact end to several of the Bronze Age uh, civilizations, and they are being ridiculed. And you know, what do anthropologists talk about meteorites? But anyways, this, well, this debate continues. Here's something, you know, if I ever decide to make a right turn out of my current research. One thing that's always bothered me is that civilization seems to have developed almost simultaneously at several locations around the world, civilizations that, as far as we know, had no communication with each other, you know? And how, why now? I mean, the humans have been around for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. Why do these civilizations develop almost at the same time? You know, in all its different places, it doesn't seem there must have been some communication. I'm not <laughs> suggesting it's an extraterrestrial thing, but it just seemed like, I and mean, that, that's of course, but most people, oh, well, there must have been aliens that, you know, yeah, I think there's a Netflix the, show about yeah. that. What's that? There's a Netflix show that basically said that, that there was, yeah, there was about alien, that. You know, I tend yeah. to think that if, <laughs> if it is more than coincidence, it's probably not as exciting as that one. Yeah. But when you mentioned, if I made the field of Pre-Mesopotamian yep. civilizations. Uh, supposedly that was the first. Uh, that is a field that's fraught with uh, uh, a lot of uh, controversy. Controversy, yeah. because yeah, even though we're finding structures older than uh -huh. uh, the because supposedly the oldest structure. Mm -hmm. So yes, there are. Well, this whole thing about when did when did humans uh, inhabit North America? For a long time, it was always 17,000 years. Now they say maybe it was 30,000 years. And again, I don't know what to think. Professor, so um, have you connected with any folks at NASA JPL? Um, so I'm wondering if you could take some of this, postulate some of this towards what they're doing at Mars. We launched the Mars with the one that's doing the you know, seismic with the earthquakes. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you could take some of these same kind of philosophy and thought process and scientific study, and maybe, I don't know, if those guys and gals are using it for the ones that, that are they're testing you know, Martian soil. I know they're digging the probe into Martian ground. Yeah, they, and I would presume that they're, they're the ones that would know this uh, price better than I would. Again, this is not my field. Uh, you know, all, I can, all I know is what I read in the papers. So let's see how much time do I have? As much as you want. <laughs> well, okay, so now, so this is all very famous, well known examples of serendipity and contrarianism. Um, what about my own? I'm going to have a number of them. Let's see, I can. Is that, what does it say? Close From the, Peter Lindecker? Oh, oh, yeah, the tectonic plate. Well, I knew that when I was a kid. I looked at, the, before I ever heard of my tectonic, I just looked at the, you know, North America, South America versus. Europe and Africa. I said, oh, they must have been together at one time. Anybody can look at that and say, oh, they must have been together. And then so some years later, somebody said, oh, great discovery. These were once together. <laughs> Wasn't that obvious? I didn't realize I could, you know, I guess not a Nobel Prize in geology, but I could have gotten some big prize as a 10-year-old. Anyway, so um, one of my examples of serendipity. Uh, back in 1984, there was this kid named Ronnie who was doing some microgravity experiments. And we get microgravity by essentially just dropping our experiment. So in NASA's drop tower at NASA Lewis, now called NASA Glenn in Cleveland, I was doing these experiments. 
Uh, and I'd done some experiments looking at different fueler mixtures and at very, very weak mixtures, barely flammable. And usually they would just sort of, the flame would propagate for a while and then suddenly extinguish. This is a very simple experiment. Just have a, a large chamber, you fill it with a combustible, weakly combustible gas, ignite it with a center of the spark, and watch this little spherical flame propagate out and either propagate all the way out to the walls or propagate a little ways and then extinguish. What I found was that if the Lewis number, Lewis number is the ratio of the heat diffusivity to the fuel diffusivity, if that was a little bit less than one, then it would propagate for a long distance before it suddenly extinguished. Whereas if the Lewis number, were, and that'd be like methane air, where the diffusivity of methane is a little bit more than that of the heat diffusivity of nitrogen, so it's the Lewis number, a little bit less than one, then it would do this. However, if I use propane, which has a higher Lewis number, it wouldn't do that. So I said, okay, well, let's try hydrogen. Hydrogen has a very low Lewis number because hydrogen is very small molecular acidity. And so what happened was this. So this is what would happen far from the uh, extinction limit. And, and this, these, these are nice pictures, but there's nothing particularly surprising. We, we knew from a long time ago that these hydrogen air flames would produce these um, cellular structures because there's a type that's called diffusive thermal instability that focuses the chemical enthalpy into these points again, because the fuel diffusivity is more of the heat diffusivity. And because the reaction rate is much more sensitive to temperature than to composition, that uh, this was well known. So but what I found was, and this is for a relatively robustly burning mixture. However, when I did the weakest mixture that would burn at all, this is what would happen. I get these little balls of flame. They wouldn't, it wouldn't be like this where they'd split and resplit and resplit. It would actually, then they would just form these little balls of flame. And then the balls wouldn't do anything. Now I only had two seconds of microgravity. So what would happen if I had more time? So I say that the, uh, it was back in 1944 that a, a Russian business, or I shouldn't say Soviet business by the name of Zeldovich, predicted the existence of these stationary balls of flame. I mean, everybody, anytime you fire a spark and you see a, uh, um, and you see a flame propagate from it, it propagates. How can it just sit there? Well, it can actually. And why is that? It's because fuel diffuses in, heat and combustion products diffuses out. It actually turns out this is a perfectly valid steady solution for any combustible mixture hmm. in principle. And it's, it's not that hard to show. It's actually easier to show than for propagating flames. Um, but it's just some counter too. No one ever seen anything like that. So, um, but actually then theory show that these flame balls are actually unstable. Just like the example I like to use is, um, I guess I can use this, is trying to balance this uh, laser pointer on its point. You know, it's, it would be a perfectly valid solution to the laws of mechanics to have this balanced on this point. But it's an unstable equilibrium because I perturb it in any direction and it keeps going. So it's an equilibrium, but it's an unstable equilibrium. But then I accidentally discovered these seemingly stable um, stationary flame balls. Um, and uh, where is it? Let's say farther from the limit, you can see these uh, propagating cellular and splitting cellular flames. So, uh, and then working with some theoreticians, I'm primarily experimentalist, but working with theoreticians, uh, we found out why, what's the, so I wasn't trying to be contrary. I didn't know about Zelovich's predictions when I first did these experiments, but what we found working with theoreticians uh, is that there's a whole branch. So basically Zeldovich had only looked at this solution that is with no heat losses. Although he did speculate, didn't prove it, but he kind of speculated heat losses might stabilize them. So what happens is there's actually with heat losses, there's actually two possible solutions, what we call, you know, by analogy with stars, the, um, the hot dwarf and the cold giant. And so it turns out the entire uh, hot dwarf branch is unconditionally unstable. And the, 
uh, cold giants are unstable to three dimensional disturbances, which is what you saw when the cells were splitting, resplitting, resplitting. They're stable to one dimensional disturbances. Is it, what, what do I mean by that? The idea is if I have a spherical flame and if it's unstable, that means if it perturbs to a slightly larger radius, it'll keep growing, or if it perturbs to a slightly smaller radius, it'll shrink and extinguish. But with the heat loss, because basically the reactant flux is proportional to the radius to the first power. It's not radius squared, it's the radius to the first power. But the heat losses, the volume is volumetric radiative heat losses, goes like radius cubed. So that means that if it grows bigger, it gets weaker because the, the ratio of heat loss to heat generation increases, and so it shrinks. Correspondingly, if it gets smaller, it gets stronger. So it's a stable solution. However, and working with some great theoreticians like myself, um, they've proved by imposing spherical harmonics disturbances that show that it's unstable, that unless there's a, enough heat loss, it's unstable to these three-dimensional disturbances. But it shows that there's a branch of solutions that's stable to both one-dimensional and three-dimensional solutions. It looks like it's quite a lot of range. As it turns out, practically speaking, it's a very, very small window of, of mixtures that actually does this. So what that says is that in order to see these stable flame balls, you need to have three things. You need to be near this extinction limit where the radiative heat loss is very important. You need to have low gravity, otherwise buoyancy <laughs> does you know, these float, they, because they're hot, they're so hot. And so they just rise to the top of the chamber like an air bubble in water and then extinguish. You never see this Earth gravity. And you have to have a low Lewis number, that's a, a low ratio of heat diffusivity to fuel diffusivity. And I just accidentally stumbled onto those, those conditions. So you said stable to disturbances. Just acoustics are those potential no. disturbances. No, these are because these are very quiescent. In fact, that's the whole point is to get the mixture as quiescent as possible. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, there are actually, I don't think the people have, I don't know what, what is quiescent. Did, what is quiescent right? for us? Quiescent. Quiescent. quiescent me. Oh, quiescent just means there's no that there's no there's no fluid motion at all. That is a propagating flame. It always generates some flow because the burned gases have much lower density than the unburned gases, so it actually produces a lot of volume. These, there is exactly with the theoretical solution has exactly zero velocity anywhere. It's only spurred by diffusion. There is no convection. These are okay. convectionless, and that's why you can only see it at, at, at zero gravity oh, because in Earth gravity okay. it'll just rise up to the top of the chamber. So, so what I guess I'm asking that people looked at uh, the acoustic. I'm trying to think. Things, uh, I'm trying to think. I don't think there's there's anyone has looked at at acoustic. And I'm certainly people force. looked at like acoustic levitation of droplets. No, 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 yeah, but I think to force. I know computationally, people have looked at like you know flame balls and like a shear flow, things like that. I don't know that acoustics. I mean, certainly there would be some acoustic, just, just like you would levitate bubbles or droplets acoustically, the same thing would happen here. It actually would be um, hard to do because you think of a bubble, okay, it's just this and everything outside of it, there's nothing happening. The flame ball, I think I'll go to slide. Let's see, I guess I didn't go into that, but no, but, but the point is the flame ball, well, actually you can see it from the governing equation. The solution, you know, the temperature varies like one over R. One over R is a very, very slowly decaying function. So actually the flame ball, you see that the visible part of the flame ball is time, they have to tip about one centimeter. The thermal field extends out tens of centimeters. Yeah, so I call a flame ball a tiny dog wagged by an enormous tail. Because the volume of the tail is like a thousand times bigger than the flame ball itself. So it's not a thin man. Yeah, it's not like a droplet or a bubble. Sense. So it'd be hard to do acoustics that wouldn't affect the, the tail as well as the dog. Yeah, that's why it's, you know, it, it's, that's why it's so, they're so fragile. The only way to see them is when there's no gravity. Because again, you, what you see is not all that what you see. It's well, not, they are reacting that far away from what we see. Well, no, that, the reacting part is here, but there's a long thermal tail where, where the heat is diffusing out and the fuel is diffusing in. Okay. There's no reaction in that zone. I mean, okay, to first approximation, 
the, the, the reaction zone is actually even a, a, a very small fraction, like a tenth of the visible. Uh, the heat is most radiating. Yeah, it's all connected. It's There's, no There's no convection. There's no convection. Yeah. yeah. That's the thing that the steady solution that I mentioned right. has no convection anywhere. Yeah. It's a, and again, it's so counterintuitive. Right. I mean, it was a, every flame I've seen has convection. Yeah. Yeah. And these are the, the only convectionless flames. Yeah. And in fact, at the time I was doing this, you know, the whole concept of doing any microgravity research was very contrary. People say, how are you doing this? This will never amount to anything. This was like in the 1980s. By 1990 or so, NASA, you know, because the space shuttle was something that become more mature, they were doing space lab missions. NASA needed, you know, more principal investigators doing ground-based experiments to then funnel them to the best ones going to space flight. So all of a sudden, about 1990, all these people that have been saying, oh, what you're doing will never amount to it. They say, and NASA sent out a solicitation for proposals. <laughs> oh, how does that going? Can we work together? So it was tested in two lower. Oh, yeah. So that's, uh, that's what I'm getting to. Okay. So another aspect of this is what well, we did in space experiments. I'll show those in the next slide. Um, one thing that we found, well, let me just show the. So there's the plane balls in space. This is slow, this is 500 seconds of test time. What you see is that at first they're moving apart from each other fairly quickly, but then they move more and more and more and more slowly. And this is sped up, like say the total time of the video is 500 seconds. Um, it looks like those true believers that say that there's aliens and you know discovery channel. Well, believe right? me, <laughs> when I give this talk to when I give this talk to a uh, a non-technical audience, I get right, all right. kinds of questions about aliens. Right. And I just say, well, I'm sorry, I'm not at liberty to discuss that. Neither did I because yeah, because obviously if I try to deny it, they'll just right. you know, they'll just think that I'm uh, yeah, part of that part of that. Yeah, so actually, so it was actually after our first mission, uh, STS-83, that just looking at that video, that I noticed in every, every single case where there were multiple flame balls, they would drift away from each other. And then I noticed, well, at first they drift apart quickly and then more slowly. I thought, well, why does it do that? Is that just... Coincidence, or why are they? What makes the move? And so then I said, "Well, let's think about that." So there's two things. I mean, flames need two things. They need heat because they need a high temperature for the reaction to occur. The reaction rate is very sensitive to temperature. And then the other thing is they need uh, fuel. So and it's it's unsymmetrical in the sense that the reaction rate. Is proportional to fuel concentration to some small power, maybe it's first power, second power, whereas it's exponentially dependent on temperature. So there's this kind of asymmetry in how they respond to temperature versus concentration. Um, and so then I realized, well, what's happening in this region here? They're stealing each other's fuel. You say, well, that'll make them weaker. Uh, but on the other hand, they're heating each other, and that should make them strong. That should make the adjacent sides stronger or more burn more rapidly than the opposite sides. Mm -hmm. But then I always wait a minute. The, the heat, you know, is lost by radiation, whereas the, the fuel is not. So the, the fuel effect, or I should say, the, so they're depleting each other of fuel in this region. Um, they've already lost the heat. So the net result is then they should move, um, they should move away from each other. Because it means you lost all the heat but you still have the same fuel concentration profiles, independent of whether it's heat loss or not. So that means the adjacent sides should be weaker than the opposing sides, which means they should drift. And I came up with just a back of the envelope, really stupid little model that predicted that it should, that the uh, rate, or I should say the separation, the, the rate of separation should go like one over a rate of distance squared, and thus the separation distance should go like one over time, or should go like the cube root of time. And there's a result. Now, this was just kind of a back of the envelope calculation. What about radiation pressure? Do you uh, apply a, a similar model? Yeah, radiation pressure is really, really small. Okay. 
Yeah, the mass is relatively so huge. Yeah, yeah, that's it's it's amazing and a very different experiment. We looked at radiation pressures, and it's really not enough in anything that we. I mean, yes, of course, it's stars and things. It's it's dominant, but for the things you know that I can do in the lab, the radiation pressure certainly affects satellites' orbits. Oh yeah, oh yeah, but not for anything that uh, yeah. that I could do in the lab. Cool. Yeah, so it turns out if they're if the flame balls are adiabatic, uh, those the two effects will exactly cancel. But because for non adiabatic flame balls, again, the fuel depletion effect uh, wins because the thermal effect disappears, they don't heat each other up because this one tries to heat each other up, but the heat is gone. Professor, what's adiabatic? Oh, I'm sorry, it means no heat transfer. No heat transfer, yeah. So does that mean do they stay around? The same, you're saying yeah, they're still to a, they're not perfectly round. They're not perfectly round. But to a first approximation, you can still treat them as round. So remember, each flame ball has this huge thermal field. And it's really, again, you have to think about flame balls completely differently than conventional flames. Because for a conventional flame, the temperature drops off exponentially. It's like an asymptotic exponential decay. And so and so one flame over here, if there are let's say two propagating flames. They wouldn't really interact in this region, but because these flame balls have these, this, this is a tiny dog wagged by this enormous tail, they interact at long distances. Have you been able to image the uh, thermal field through IR? No, it's it's uh, it's so weak. We we have you know we can put thermocouples. We've done that. We put thermocouples in there, but the problem is that the flame ball, you know. You can't tell the flame ball, okay, go, go to where that thermocouple is. <laughs> so we do get some data from thermocouples, but it's not, we don't get enough data from the thermocouples to really tell us that much. <coughs> okay, so I don't want to, we're already, we're already over time. Let me, let me go with, say, one more. Okay. Let's see. Which of, because I have several of these, we obviously don't have time to get through. Let me think about the ones that I, let's see. Well, okay, we, we can vote. Spiral flames is one. Um, flames in Haley Shaw cells is another. Um, let's see. I think, let's see, that's a, uh, let's see. What do I want to do? I think I like this one because it, it's it's relatively simple. You don't have to be an expert in combustion to understand this one. So that was an example of serendipity. Here's an example of contrariness. It's a very simple experiment, very important practical applications. Uh, is that until I did this work, everybody thought that with a um, if I had flame spreading over a solid fuel bed where the direction of flow was the same as the direction of spread. That, that would be like if I have buoyancy induced flow, that would be like the flame propagating upward. Okay, because in the buoyancy effect and the flame spread is in the same direction, as opposed to when the other one is opposing flow, the flame spread was propagating downward. I keep saying, I should, oh wow, I've got a lot of stuff here in the chat. I should really pay attention to, uh, let's see. Okay, this is a long conversation. We'll go over that after. Okay, so, so the idea is, again, that, and what people thought is that this will always be self-accelerating because you see what will happen is the flame length will grow and then that means you'll be able to transfer more heat to the fuel bed that will increase the rate at which the flame spreads. And I thought, wait a minute, does that mean it's going to go supersonic and eventually faster than the speed of light or something? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think so. But even well before we get to those limits, what might limit the rate of flame spread? And I thought, well, you know, if I have, let's say, let's say a flame spreading over my phone, I hope that doesn't happen. <laughs> but what will happen is that the phone has a finite width and this, so the flame spreading upward like this, you know, eventually the flame length, well, because there's a certain boundary layer thickness, those of you about flume mechanics, there's a certain boundary layer thickness. Well, the flame, if the, if the boundary layer thickness is larger than the width of the fuel sample, then I'm going to lose a lot of heat and momentum to the sides. And that's going to limit the, the, 
the spread rate. So I said, well, what, and what's the limiting case? At what point, at my first thought was, okay, there's just one limiting case is where the boundary layer of thickness, the, the flame length will grow in this direction, will grow until the boundary layer of thickness is comparable to the width of the sample. And we can't grow beyond that. And that's true. Uh, and it scales differently depending whether it's a very thin sheet of fuel, like a piece of paper, or very thick, like a slab of, you know, of uh, acrylic or something. Um, but that's uh, not important to this discussion here. Um, so, and then well, what I found was that was actually, and I, I did again, a very simple analysis and said, well, the, the spread rate should grow like the cube of the width of the fuel sample. That is, this is the steady spread. You know, you have to have a long enough sample so that it reaches the steady spread rate. But once it does, then it should scale like the, uh, the width and sure enough, when you plot it out, you know the slope is uh, it goes like the uh, it goes like Rashoff number to the first power. Rashoff number has width cubed in it, so it does scale like that. However, that I found for very wide samples, it didn't follow that. It just became constant rather than following this thing width cubed. And then I realized, well, what else can limit the spread rate? Well, heat loss by radiation from the fuel surface. See, my whole life. Revolves around Lewis number. I was at NASA Lewis, <laughs> even though that's a different Lewis number. That, that, that's a different Lewis than the Lewis number. Um, that uh, the, the classic textbook in my field is by Lewis and Von Elb. It's, that's another Lewis. Both of uh, both of my grandfather's names were Lewis, although spelled O L O L O U I S, not L E W I S. <clears throat> Anyway, so then I realized that, that okay, if the sample is super wide, then the, the bound, what if it's infinitely wide? Then certainly the boundary layer thickness cannot be limited. Does that mean an infinitely wide sample will just keep growing? But then no, because basically the rate at which, the rate at which I um, transfer heat to the fuel bed and thus we get more fuel vapor to burn scales like, you know, depending on whether it's lamb or turbulent, like the, uh, um, like the, the uh, um, scales, something like the length to the one half, or sorry, one third or one fourth power, whereas the loss will scale like length to the first power. So I realized at some point, then heat loss by radiation from the fuel surface has to be the only factor, not heat loss to the sides if it's a very wide sample. And so then that, that gives you then you know, then a constant spread rate independent of this thing called the Grashoff number, which involves the width cubed. And sure enough, then we did a student did a bunch of experiments, all different kinds of mixtures, all different kinds of pressures. Uh, notice that this dimensionless parameter called the Grashoff number, which is basically gravity times width cubed uh, divided by viscosity squared. I noticed by, we vary from a hundred to a billion. Uh, and so data did that trend. But it's very contrarian. This, again, before I did these experiments, people thought that it was inherently unsteady and it would just grow, the, the spread rate would grow indefinitely. So if we were building up, if we were spreading up, let's say, the side of a building, it would just keep growing and growing. But you know, there are two things we found that, that limited that. And it turns out, well, which, so I have several different things going on. One is the, if the flow is laminar or turbulent, it's either suppressed, the, the, the spread rate growth is suppressed either by boundary layer heat to losses to the side or by radiation. So I even came up with a, a whole map here of when it's laminar, when it's turbulent, when it's uh, influenced by radiation versus convection. And so it turns out for your typical case, for air in one atmosphere, you kind of hit like three of them. Okay, so I mean, I could go on and on, but uh, no, you could. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always say that, like, when I have a group of prospective uh, students and their parents, then we have these uh, these uh, these meetings where I talk about the department and all that. I say, look, we can do this one of two ways. Either I can give a presentation or you can just ask me questions. 
And since most people's number two fear is death and the number one fear is public speaking, faculty don't have that problem. So I recommend that I don't give a presentation and you just ask me questions. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, to, uh, to conclude, let's see. Um, in this area of serendipity, in every case that I mentioned, researchers are looking for something more or less unrelated to their actual discovery. Um, and to say, well, why did that happen? It's, you know, chance favors the prepared mind or the, the variation on that that I like is, uh, I first heard it uh, quoted by Gary Player, the golfer, who said, the harder I work, the luckier I get. You know, think about it, it makes sense, it's golf. <laughs> Nobody can expect to hit a hole in one, even a great golfer like Gary Player. But the harder you work, the more, the closer you're gonna to get to that hole, the greater your chances of, uh, of getting a hole. Wasn't there a number of numerical published now to the hours, right? What's that? Um, so, oh, like 10,000 hours, 10, hours mm -hmm. your probability of now becoming a yeah. top rated player in any given sports field increases exponentially, mm -hmm. right? I always have students that say, well, you know, I want, uh, I'm thinking about getting a master's or a PhD degree, but I want to take a few years off and work first. And I say, okay, do you play sports? And I say, yeah, I play sports. Okay, so are you going to tell your coach, I'm going to take a few years off for my sport and come oh. back to it? <laughs> say no athlete ever, right? Right, right. So, you know, this whole academic thing, it's, it's, it's like a sport. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you don't, use your skills, you're going to lose them. So I always tell students, if you can possibly afford it, you know, just blast through, get all your education. Yeah, maybe you won't be quite have quite the perspective, but I think the advantage of keeping your skills live and active will outweigh the, the lack of perspective that you have. And 10,000 hours only applies if you're really focused on getting yeah. better for those 10,000 hours. Not yeah. just showing up. Oh, yeah. okay. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, but these are people I say that were really focused and perhaps obsessed with the discovery. And I think the surprise is most of the I thought I thought when I first researched this, they would be mostly people very early in their careers and kind of one hit wonders. It was absolutely not that way. The average age of the examples that I gave was 39. Uh, which now seems pretty young to me, but uh, <laughs> and, and they were not one hit wonders at all. Like Percy Spencer had something like 300 patents. So these were people that, when they made this great discovery, because I say in some cases it had been made previously, but these are the ones that actually said, aha, this is important, because they had the perspective. They'd been in the field a long time, they were experts in the field, and they knew that this is something I really need to, uh, to investigate. So, and again, I give this talk to our graduate students, you know. Look at what everyone else is doing and then doing something that's different. Maybe not 180 degrees, but maybe 90 degrees. The example I like to give is back in 1998, I went to a combustion conference. It was in Boulder, Colorado, and I uh, brought a bunch of my students. And then the, the, it was a week-long meeting. And then the Saturday after the main meeting, there was like a satellite meeting on a particular subtopic as a turn of turbulent premixed gas combustion. I couldn't go that Saturday because I had my wife with me and it happened to be our anniversary. So I just sent my students to the satellite conference and they came back afterwards and said, oh, wow, you know, this was great. Thank you for sending me. I met all the big names in the field and everybody in the room said, all these big names said, the best way to study turbulent premix combustion is with a Bunsen type flow, with a turbulent flow, my turbulent was the landing. I said, thank you very much. I know I will never study turbulent bus planes. <laughs> not because it's necessarily, maybe they're not wrong, but they're already doing that and they're way ahead of me. So let me look for something else. So I say, look at what everyone else is doing and then maybe go orthogonalism, not turbulism. Also, turn the knobs, you know, a lot of times students that find they just want to, you know, Say, well, they did, the, they did the pressure from two atmospheres to two and a half atmospheres. What happens if you went to one atmosphere? What happens if you went below one atmosphere? What's the lowest pressure you can go? What's the highest pressure you can go safely? You know, this I always have to put this safely when we're doing combustion experiments, obviously, but turn it off 
as far to the left and as far to the right. Like, for example, the person in flame balls. I made the weak, I found the weakest mixture I could possibly get to burn. In fact, the mixtures that I burned in space are the weakest flames that have ever been burned either in space or on the ground. The, mm -hmm. the flame balls are typically produce about one watt of thermal power. And we have wow. radiometers so we can determine that. And by comparison, a birthday candle is 50 to 100 watts. And you could never get this flame to burn at Earth gravity because it could just be ripped apart by, uh, by convection, by wave convection. Um, and you know, pursue odd results more than, uh, than expected ones. So we're teaching, we're professing our guardians, especially the younger workforce, to, to write things and maybe even to fail. That, that's the approach. Oh, yeah. It'll fail because we will learn certain things. Oh, yeah. I always see may not. Yeah. I'm not an expert at failing. First failure. Well, I just, I just tell my students don't be afraid to, you know, break things, you know, but make your mistakes quickly, cheaply, and safely. Right. right. Yeah. 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 Don't be afraid to fail. Don't fail. Yeah. Don't be afraid to, you know, break a thermocouple or something. You know, you don't don't want to uh don't, you don't want to break a you know, two hundred fifty thousand dollar you know uh, laser uh, particle over image well, a symmetry system, but a ten dollar thermocouple don't don't even think about breaking. Also, well, you, you still pivot. Once you fail, you still need to pivot. Oh yeah, of course. I think I'm always saying I think sometimes because we do kind of break the Silicon Valley, you know, mm -hmm. that we kind of like romance the failure instead mm -hmm. of just. Right. <laughs> yeah. Also, I say that you know, do not implicitly trust the current wisdom. You know, the old trust but verify. I always like that expression because trust but verify means I don't trust you at all. If I trust you, I wouldn't have to verify. You know, and then we're talking about this earlier. You know, the contrarianism. You know, stand up for what you still believe, but again, after careful. And very self-critical deliberation. I always tell my students, um, be your own worst critic, unless you'd rather have someone else be your worst critic. And that's almost like a science. I mean, that's rather an art than a science. I think we have to kind of coach, mentor, and really, really dig that into the professional philosophy because I think that's Gardner's over time, right? Yeah, and in fact, I say that all the time to my students. This is where the science ends and the art begins. So there's a sort of nuance. Yeah. Because engineering and you know academic research, it's not just science, it's, it's an art, it's a practice. It's like any other practice, you know, medicine or law, business. You have to fail, but you have to learn from the failures. So question, I'm sorry, back to your you were talking about the flame uh, velocity mm -hmm. as a function of uh we had that chart atmosphere pressure. Oh <clears throat> right there. Oh, this one? Yeah. Okay. So uh you're saying that line represents uh Where's uh, terrestrial conditions? Oh, well, this just depends on two things. It depends, the Planck number depends on the emissivity of the fuel bed. Uh, and then it also depends on the width of the sample. So this, this is right, the, right. the line. So, well, so how, does that, how does atmospheric pressure uh, oxygen? Well, this is all just air here. So this is, I mean, right. yes, uh, changing oxygen concentration will, will shift these. So, so I guess my fundamental question is, from this, uh, would this tell us that uh, forest fires on certain exoplanets would be oh. extremely different? I'm sorry. I, I'm no, no, no. <laughs> it's interesting you mention that because I give a lot of homework and exam problems. Is yes, let's say we're on planet X. Right. It's the same as Earth, except let's say the oxygen concentration is exactly. double or the pressure is half. Oh, yeah, and then what's how does that affect the burning rate or the extinction limits or this? Size of the flame ball. Yeah, I do that all the time. Okay. So, I know it is a significant effect. Yeah. Or also, um, I, I have a horse named Cavalier. So, I say Cavalier Fuels Corporation has developed a new fuel wow. with you know 10% higher heating value than gasoline. How would these properties of an engine be affected? You know, some are not affected at all, and some are increased 10%, some increase more than 10%, some decrease. I want to see because I like those kind of problems because then I can, without having to go through a lot of equations, I can test their understanding of a lot of different concepts very quickly. I don't have to write out a whole long thing for just to get one of those. Mm -hmm.
And uh, I think with that, we have so. Yeah, so again, the, the idea is that, uh, you know, these great discoveries come uh, usually by, by accident. And the, the key point is that I guess Og didn't think anything of this, but Og's unnamed friend realized this was something important. And so I think with that, I'll stop and uh, thank you all for spending some time here on Saturday. I want to take some questions from him. Oh, yeah, please. Um, Dr. Landaker, I, I saw you have a question. And Deso, Amar, and uh, Colonel Shortis, you want to say something? I saw you have some question on the in the chat. Or uh, Dr. Perfect, we've got some Q&A, let's see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's um, the earlier one. Okay, so. Let's see. Erno, if you want to speak out, you have the mic. Access. Yeah, contrarian seems to be quite a kind of scrutinizing ideas. Okay. So the events are things. Okay. Opportunities and challenges. Yeah. Yeah, of course, we all use that term. We never say, here's our problems. Here are our opportunities, right? Yeah, but it's, it's again, yeah. I, I expressed it here in the scientific, in the context of basic you know, academic research. But of course, it applies to business. So you think, okay, like for example, I was thinking of Amazon. It's that, you know, when Amazon first came up, is it you're going to sell books online? People don't read books anymore. They read things on the internet. People aren't going to want to buy books. Stupid idea. I've never invested in Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> but let's say, then, then I can think of a number of, um, or even like Twitter or something like that. But you can only, you know, what is it? 128 characters or something. Who's going to want to read a bunch of 128 character messages? Shows you my business. Good thing I'm in academics and not in business. Let's see. This is Dejer checking in. Go ahead. Yeah, so real quickly, I mean, I've been, uh, I grew up reading books about inventors, and that's all I did as a kid, starting since I could read. Initially, I've got George Westinghouse and others, probably 150 books. And, uh, and so I became an inventor professionally and an aviator. But um, I would just say, like, when you talk, you have to be very careful when we look at these, these examples of things that work. Um, you're, you have to look at the ones that don't work as well. Otherwise, you get diluted in thinking that you have a high probability of success. And and the other thing is when 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 you get these stories, like you'll talk about Amazon. I mean, the real Amazon. I think my understanding of Amazon is the reason it works uh, from watching it from the beginning was not because people do or don't buy books, but because nobody needs to inspect a book before they purchase it, and also that the uh, the mail rate for selling media is lower for moving books than any other object. And also that, you know, when he started out, he just, you just run the numbers. You're competing with bookstores. And this is just a fairly long winded, but Barnes and Noble had to sell one book per item, per store, one copy of each one in order to keep the, the doors open. So he could destroy those businesses by paying no taxes and not paying an actual fee to move the books. So you really have to look for a way to screw other people if you're going to make these inventions work on a lot of them when it comes down to marketing or logistics. But I would just say that, you know, the thing, you, and I put it in the chat, is the most important thing as an inventor is you have to understand the state of the art completely about what you're about to get into. You have to have a very sincere reason to think you have an advantage, which is either redefining the problem or maybe not solving all of it, just solve half of it. Sometimes people wait around to solve all of it and they never get there. And then um, you kind of, again, you have to kind of think in the future and get there before the, the, the reality catches up to you. You have to actually finish this. You have to have the thing working before other people catch on to what you're doing. And I'll just shut up with that. But it's, it's, a, uh, you know, it's a tough business. And, um, and, it's, and it's always interesting. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think one thing that helped Amazon that I didn't think about, well, I think what helped them initially 
was beyond what you said, which is always quite true, is that then people would start reviewing books, you know, and say, okay, you know, is this a good book? You know, without having to actually read the whole book, some people, and then you'd see reviewers over and over say, oh, I, I like this person's taste in books. I don't like this person, I'm gonna ignore their review, but I like this person's taste. Oh yeah, they like this book and this book and this book. And then, so I think that helped a lot. And then of course, you can extend it to other products, you know, like a phone. Nobody buys a phone nowadays without reading reviews, right? Um, and so when they extended other things, yeah, if somebody liked this phone, somebody didn't like this phone, somebody said it was, you know, that the font was too small or something and my eyes aren't good, but maybe that's not important to you. And then of course, the next thing was of course, their whole distribution system, which is just insane. I'm sure that they, they must put things on the truck thinking I might want to buy it. And it's, you know, the truck is going by and then I hit send and then the truck just drops it off if I had actually, you know, get purchased or doesn't do that. It's actually, that, they did have that algorithm for the warehouses. Every yeah, yeah, pre-stage pre and number yeah. of items. Yeah, they have AI yeah, that you know, start. Yeah, yeah. 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 So that's the most important thing I realized. <laughs> oh, that's really what. Well, the reason it worked is because if, if you can go to the record store model, um, which is, they used to have 90% of the sales in a record store were the top 40 hits. So people would come in and buy exactly what they knew about. And the difference with Amazon is that, again, as you stated, people will give, give reviews, meaning they can keep a product alive, even though the store can't afford to put it on the shelf in an expensive retail location. And that is the development of the long tail of distribution, meaning they actually sell more records that are unpopular than the ones that they do that are on the top 40. And again, the reason for that is because the cost of communicating back and forth is next to zero. It's not about waiting for people to send in an envelope and opening it up and distributing that. It became instantaneous. So I lived in, I lived in San Francisco during the dot-com explosion. My best friends, they, they started Wired Magazine. I had the official party house for San Francisco. So I was able to see all this stuff going down and, and have these people at my house. And we kind of like talk these things through. So it was an interesting time, but um, uh, obviously, like I said, you have to be very careful about only studying the successful ones because they will mislead you in that, like you said, there's serendipity, there's timing. You can't necessarily repeat those experiences because the rest of the world catches up. The loopholes that they used are, are get filled up, et cetera. And so really when, when it comes down to uh, uh, positioning yourself into a new invention, you really have to have an understanding of who is looking at it. And like you said, on the contrarian side, who's ignoring kind of the approach because they're all jumping on the same bandwagon, usually. Usually inventions are not particularly interesting. It's just marketing departments trying to make, you know, that thing that they can claim it's exactly the same on steroids because they perceive that as the highest probability, but you've got a lot of people doing the same thing. So it's good to be an outsider. And once you're on the road less traveled, you have to stay there. So I have to ask, uh, so you had this the Silicon Valley Entrepreneur Party House. How does Silicon Valley Entrepreneurs Party relative to the general public and keep this G-rated? Or maybe you can't if you have to keep it No, uh, at the time, it was uh, an explosion of people trying to get employees because it was mostly about growth. And the challenge was, how do I get more bodies in here? There was a complete... Um, you know, it was a shuck and jive. We there was there was in the last quarter of ten of 1999, they spent 1.6 billion dollars on dot com ads in the Bay Area. It was ridiculous, and so a lot of what it was was perceived growth because in any and it was a tech bubble. This the foundation of any uh, tech bubble or any you know any bubble or any con is you need to have new technology, and other people have to have the perception that they don't quite understand it. So they will speculate on it, but be, and they'll speculate on it before they actually have time to do the due diligence. So the main thing that was happening at that time was, you know, people were just, it, it was just a, an amazing time where kids that, you know, were, were used to be working at McDonald's, but now they were buying houses. And it was this whole kind of evolution into uh, A, getting support for the ideas that we were doing. And, you know, just the use of the Internet as a way uh, to communicate um, interactively, because prior to that, I mean, some friends of mine had the first interactive television show in the world, which was in Berlin. 
and they operated purely on uh, postcards and phone calls. So you could send them a postcard, they would read it, and then they would do something on television, right? I mean, this is 1992. Uh, the well had just started. And so this whole explosion was really about people being overwhelmed with the opportunities. And it wasn't some kind of weird party scene. It was certainly raves. Uh, my friends started Burning Man. So I would say that's probably you know, the best way to describe what the party scene was like. We, we created this party in the desert and, um, and now people still go there, you know? Other questions from the home audience or the studio audience? Dr. Pedro Rakla, do you want to say something? Well, I'm wondering about the mantra in, in the Silicon Valley of fake it till you make it, and Theranos, for example. You need to have a certain amount of guts to um, fake it. Yeah. I yeah, I wouldn't say that that's guts. I would just say those people are sick, and, and they're only interested in the trappings of success. They have no interest in the actual benefits of what you're creating. So my rule is the only revenge is good art or the only success is good art. So yeah, as, as art is subjective, you have to look at your own developments and determine whether or not that's something that's worth having. I think, I think when Einstein died, he felt pretty good about his ideas and that had benefit to him. When you have people that are uh, sycophants or megalomaniacs, the, their, their only perception they have is they're filling up a hole and they're loading it with Lamborghinis and houses uh, multiple houses, uh, servants. Those people don't actually create good art. But unfortunately, in a pimpocratic society where you know the pimp needs all this, people get out there and work for it. Um, it is it it it's a feedback loop, and um, that's the challenge. It's not these are not actually lasting inventions, and you can't say that the system doesn't work for them. They do get those trappings, and if another person only wants trappings, they will perceive that person as successful when what they created was a scam. Yeah, well, I've read think... a lot of biographies. I was thinking of Edison, who used to call a press conference and say, I've invented the light bulb when he hadn't yet, <laughs> but he was now under pressure to deliver. It was a way to motivate himself. Yeah, and I think about even, you know, what, what motivates me? It's not money. I'm sure I could be making more money doing something else. I mean, make a good living, like complaining. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm motivated by you know, again, being satisfied really with the way of managing the department and creating this family within aerospace and mechanical engineering. And scientifically that I can, you know, say, yes, I made some contributions. I'm fond of pointing out that if I had not done this, like the flame ball experiment, if I had not done this as a postdoc in 1984, this knowledge probably wouldn't still not exist. And that's, that's somewhat so, Professor, isn't there a story to tell about the underdog then? That one person that is deep in the in the bowels of you know engineering department doing slaving over that work night and day, night and day, and is not necessarily popular, right? And is not known. So I, I, I'm reminded of a, a presentation that Neil deGrasse Tyson gave here in LA. He goes, just think about what those people were doing in 19 post World War One and all the science and technology that came as a result of and a lot of those people weren't typically popular right yeah oh and, and in fact um you know you may raise a very good point i said it was a princeton for seven years i got denied tenure there in part because some of the people writing the letters of recommendation for me thought i had not seen flame bowls or that i had not seen what i'd seen in Spread. So yeah, I think so that you almost kind of have to be that failure or that cast out, right? Yeah. No, not qualified, not warranted. Yeah. Maybe to some extent not welcomed, right? <laughs> and not validated. So yeah. And maybe, maybe there's something to be said about that. Yeah. Maybe there is some proof and validation in that, right? Oh yeah. Or that that hey, you're going down the right track if you are being cast out. If people well, are not, you, you, <laughs> you have to be careful about that because. If you keep saying, oh, then I'm getting cast out because my ideas are too good. You know, oh, of course, of course. <laughs> that that, that can't be true, but, <laughs> but that's a very dangerous, it's very dangerous yeah. to get into that mindset where you think that's always true. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I think so. Yeah, very contrarian. It is beneficial if you're right. Yeah. 
I mean, essentially, exactly. Like, so. <laughs> or the case should be now go prove it. Yeah, like, right. Now, yeah, and that's it. why somebody like Louis Alvarez is, you know, he certainly had the chops, he had the credentials to say, you can't just ignore this Nobel or in physics. Right, right. Even though he was now in a completely different field, he was no, he was no dummy for sure. And so, he, he had, you know, I think at the time he died, his, his ideas were still not accepted. But from wow. what I read, he didn't care. He said, I know this is right. Yeah. But he also had none, but I know it's right. He also had to put the capital to try anyway. Yeah. If he didn't have the Nobel Prize, people wouldn't have paid him to go off and do this other thing. Yeah. So. But isn't that one of our problems? Is we're <laughs> right now we seem to be in a moment in time where being right is more important than the truth. What you didn't say is uh what about the truth? And what about the pursuit of truth? And is it sometimes discovering the truth <laughs> through uh contradiction rather than affirmation. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know my life is full of many deep truths that I have discovered uh, through negative uh, experiences, as you said, versus uh, mm -hmm. uh, affirmation. Mm -hmm. And being right is based on what emotion and, right. and opinion, yeah. right? <laughs> or having the most like for your posts on social media. Uh, right. Everyone has 100 likes is obviously right, and one who has no likes must be wrong. Right? And to that's some sort of things, the, yeah, I can catalog like, that under It's like become the measure of yeah. how many followers, how many anonymous followers you have on Twitter, people you don't even know. Yeah. I right. provide the act for commission. Yeah, to show that right. Yeah. Well, I could catalog commission. that under ignorance of populism, right? Yeah. 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 But we have finite resources. That's the problem. Is we put our mind towards the things that. Fan base. I mean, <laughs> so I think Dr. Ken wants a photo yeah. moment here. Yeah. Um, so let's take uh, Professor again. Uh, and this is our. It's really our great, great and honor. And uh, uh, thanks for Professor Sapo for airing away. Uh, so anything you want, we'll behind you. We'll pick family, we'll do everything for you. Yeah. Well, wish you have an opportunity. Yeah, well, well, thank you. I, okay, so I can't help but make a shameless plug for our students that uh, in the Region 6 student paper competition, our teams won first and second yeah. in the team division and first place in the individual division. And I asked the students then afterwards, and in previous years, we've done very well. You know, we're competing against yeah. some, some big name schools, you know, one with a bear. Cross country. <laughs> no, it even has like a like a, a tree for a mascot or something. Oh, and then there's some <laughs> then there's some small technical college in Pasadena that yeah. I'm sure you've never heard of. But uh, but in case I asked them why did we do so well, they said one word: MECOPS. That's our junior level we call mechoptronics course, where they really learn how to do experiments, not just to do the experiments, but how to present the results on you know on paper and you know, in person. For example, they said none of the other presentations. They had none of them had error bars on their paper. So, mm, well, yeah. that, that means the competition, you know, it, it's easy to compete, you know, because right. I mean, obviously, you know, professionals, you, you know, if you don't say what's the uncertainty of data, that you're not going to get promoted. Okay, so, so I have to, I'm sorry, this was said that. <laughs> so there was, uh, um, there were three people who were being um, interviewed by the company president for promotions technically. And first, first he brought in the, um, the theoretician and he said, okay, I'm going to ask you one question. What is two plus two? So he pulls out his notepad and kind of screwed with it. Then an hour later he says, okay, well, the answer seems to be about four, but I've only carried out one term, the asymptotic expansion, and I haven't checked the radius of convergence. So that's not okay. okay. Brings in the computationalist. Okay, what is two plus two? So it goes out, you know, programs it up, comes back an hour later with a stack of printouts. So the answer is 3.99999. <laughs> then he brings in the experimentalist. He says, what is two plus two? The experimentalist looks around the room, shuts the door, goes into the kitchen, and says, Well, what do you want it to be? <laughs> <laughs> and then you tell you the other three. So so, Professor, are you guys so now um, bringing this to campus to the university? 
Uh, is this embedded now formally um, contrary into your syllabus at the undergrad and grad? Oh. Are, are we coaching, training, mentoring? The, 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 yeah, is that a formal course that you guys offer here at both the undergrad to impress that? And at yeah, the who is the most disagreeable student? In your <laughs> Why that one? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's that's an interesting. If we're going to make an impact, I mean, right? I certainly do. You know, I, I mentioned some of these examples in class and all, but but you raise an interesting point. How do we formalize that in a way yes. that students can pick it up again, not just as sort of an anecdotal way, but actually to incorporate that. That's actually good. practically well, applicable. I've yeah. heard that there is collaboration like with film school or with artists yes. and stuff with maturity. Yes. So oh, yeah. you'd think that would be a path toward discovery or coming up with ideas that might be worth well, yeah. like research or the, or the entrepreneurial. Oh, yes. Yeah. And the whole thing, and, like most yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the reason why I mentioned this, I had a chance to spend some time with the folks at College of the Arts in Pasadena mm -hmm. that do the automotive design. Mm -hmm. And and they push them to that extreme. They're like, no, I want to take the core engineering in you, and I want to throw you way out there in the left field. I want you to learn. I want you to understand. And I'm going to challenge your thought process. Mm -hmm. And what they end up coming up with, it's like you're building mines, and you're mining a mindset in this country at an industrial base that's going to have massive exponential yeah. Interesting, because I teach the freshman introduction to mechanical engineering class. And one of the projects I have to do is build a 3D printed bridge. Because by the end of the semester, they learn about stresses and strains and material properties and all that. And they've learned how to use SolidWorks to draw this. They've also learned how to use the finite element code. I mean, they don't know how to find the code, but they can turn, they can push the buttons and, you know, turn oh, okay. the right. Right. solutions. Yeah, they can't generate their own finite element code, but they can. They can, you know, calc use it to calculate the bond DC stress and, and all that. And so every year, some student does something, you know, to their design such that the next year I have to change the rules because that's not what my intent was. I say, well, yeah, I guess I have to let you do that, but that wasn't really my intent for you to, be able to do that. And so that just like in all these student design competitions, you've really done your job if next year they have to change your rules as their own rules as a result of what you did. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. The other one is the first project that you should do is um, they have to build a, you know, just a robotic vehicle that then climbs a ramp, it's a fairly steep ramp, and then tries to push another one off the top. It's called King of the Hill. And these folks, what they do, you know, the, the biggest design limitation is you can only use two AA batteries. However, these people were smart enough to go, well, I could charge these bank of supercapacitors. <laughs> you know, so they can, they, they don't even, they don't actually don't use the batteries during the competition because they have plenty of charge in these right. supercapacitors, you know, for the short distance that they have to travel up the ramp and push up the other side. So, <laughs> and then I encourage them to use like an Arduino it's not really necessary for this simple contest, but I give them extra points if they use an Arduino. And actually one, so they couldn't get the Arduino to work, so they actually just sort of put the Arduino on their card and said, hey, the, so next year they actually have to, the Arduino actually has to control be, something. Control something. Let's just say it has to, um, it has to have some some electronic function, right? Hmm. Well, I think I've kept everybody uh, way longer than the hour that uh, advertised. So again, thank you again for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. And are you going to sign us off here offline? Or yeah, oh, yeah, professor. Excellent presentation. Um, it was interesting and there are a lot. I hope you pay attention to the yes. quiz on Tuesday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. So you go out the door and then across to the other side. You'll see there's a, it's an all gender restroom and then there's a men's room. So, Kyle, what's the, what are you thinking? Your, your future path? Any thoughts? Oh. No pressure, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We asked uh, freshmen in high school what 
in, in, what's your, what are you going to do, right. you you do when you retire? And do you give yeah, extra points on your exams for contrary answers? Yeah. 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 I give a point if they. If it's an interesting look at So, we will have these already done. And what high school or for master of high school? Private private school? Because a lot of those. So where's a good place to eat us on? How do you like in the program? So a lot of the so it's quite the after but uh, yeah, it's Val Kelmer when he did right on the top, right before the top, yeah, uh, real genius. Like, they don't have the generation, yeah, yeah. If they ever get a chance to just you know stop by on base, I'm pretty sure because you guys are not as good, yeah. So I'm sure about it, but they are happy because they are happy because they have. Buzz Aldrin, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really to to bring in your channel. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. going to be, you know, dog and bone show. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. 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 yeah.
I think there's a lot of restrictions. Oh, I'm trying to work on my Amy buddy. He just got put yeah, on the main guy. And Amy, I don't know if it's a shock, but oh my God, what they're doing in space. And that is a virus like some main. They're taking all the guys. It's like, oh, the Academy Brothers back in the day. Oh, you had to generate. And they're doing all the cyber stuff with what is evolutionary technology. The model that's that's three D. They're doing but yeah, no, it's, it's just amazing. It's a really neat thing. I went in there, it's like, with some young stuff. Like, but you, you know, speak like you're a general. You do with kids. No, they're actually you know, growing up to not be classic. And they're trying to learn all the time. You know, one of the things like, really, actually, can be done. One of the other STEM groups in the Air Force. So don't be scout off the Space Force later on for your career because. And uh, what it we is. are a seed because of some polymer, and you mix the two, stuff, and then it's foam. It's like yeah, the, yeah, it's yeah. like, yeah. I'm just saying, yeah, well, no, it's, it's not, not it's really, it's like, like, it's like, like, it's like, like it's the foaming and so it's a question of the issue. And so they'll put it in a but it's expected to be He's now, yeah, he's out of the U.S. when it turns out to be a face. I think Professor Lino Ronnie Hart was asking about it. And there was a big time by the book. Is that what you got? Yeah, there's a good one. No, we can talk about that. Yes, I'm sure it's all together. Josh to leave, but I may go. So it's got a handful of different yeah, uh, you guys will just go ahead and start moving in. Let's go. They were like, start walking. By the way, what did you find? Like, what's your name? Excuse me, 41. I'm like, okay, I was like, that's great. I got an airline. Well, why should I play the other ones? We're looking at me right now. They've got military side going back to space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've got some of the things that have been going on. They've got some of the things that have been going on. Yeah, so all right. Probably won't hurt, but you know, it's kind of. Oh, the presentation probably just saying I was a metal line guy for years, but I was back in space. Yeah, but I like the comment about well, how do you put this into you guys want to join us? Right, I mean, I sort of yeah, anecdotally talk to these things, but I think it would be interesting to try to formalize it so keep your ear open. I the finals will not retire because by choice. So then you can also carry on the conversation. Whenever you decide to stop, you can have 20 years of space experience. Right. So I'll go back. Yes. I was a little bit.